is here and the applicants. Great. So good evening, everyone. It's just a little bit after seven o'clock and let's open up the uh, planning board meeting for this Thursday, July 9th, 2020. Um, the planning board is nine members. We have a quorum tonight. We have two members who are absent who couldn't join us, but we certainly have sufficient numbers to go through this um, public hearing and the agenda. Um, <clears throat> so first, what we'd like to do, in, if there's anybody who has come into our Zoom meeting, um, not here for the public hearing about Hampton Street, but would like to talk about another issue that has not come before the board tonight or isn't on the agenda, if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand or shout loud. So given that, I, is that somebody raising their hand from a telephone? Are we all good? Okay. Uh, where did he go? Mr. Halverson, would you like to make a comment on something other than Hampton Street, or are you just waving your hand? No, we were here for the Hampton Street hearing. Okay, very good. We'll be getting to that. So, and Ian, Mr. Fraser, are you here for the Hampton Street hearing? You're on mute. So not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, to, to make a request that uh, thank you for sending out the cards. I am. Um, the font that you use on your it was very easy to get in one you could just the fonts that you use the for the postcards the ones look like an L so it makes it really difficult to type in the meeting ID. Yeah, just use this. Um, Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Oh well, yeah, you bet. You can just use that little password. One two seven five two four. Hi, anybody who's on the on the call from the public, if, if you can mute if you're not speaking, that would be really Helpful. Yeah, it's weird. I think maybe I see Bill Musanti's, Musanti's uh, microphone. I think I'll up. just mute all and then unmute the planning board members. Okay. It's just like Okay, so again, we have no one from the public who wants to speak on other anything other than the Hampton Street. So we're most of the folks here are for that hearing. So um, given that, um, before we hear from the applicant, I would just like to mention that I believe we were going to have one person in the public, Mr. Kunath, Rodney Kunath. Is he here, Carolyn? Uh, no, he opted um, not to um, come in. Okay, all right. So this is Butter, Mr. Kunitz is uh, um, deaf. He's, uh, <coughs> so we're going to later on read his letter into the public record. Um, we tried to make other accommodations so that he could join us, but it's a little tricky in this format. Okay, so the only other caveat I'd like to say is before the applicant begins, um, Myself and my wife, George Kohat and Deb Argera, we uh, purchased a house from this developer, Pioneer, um, Danny McCann and Denise McCann, seven years ago. So I'd just like to put that out on the table and we are neighbors. Um, I don't have any fiscal arrangement with them at, this, at any time um, at this point. So, but I wanted to let folks know that, that we had that relationship seven years ago in 2013. Okay, so then, all that being said, perhaps we could ask the applicant to provide a presentation to the planning board and the public. We'll go through that presentation, and then the <coughs> planning board members will ask the applicant technical questions about to clarify issues. After those technical questions are finished by the planning board members, we'll open it up to the public. We'll ask the public to provide their information, their um, feelings, their observations related to the project, hopefully for no more than about three minutes for each person. 
and we just ask you not to try to repeat yourself. Um, and then <coughs> after the public hearing, the planning board will have a discussion about the merits of the application. So that's the process. So now we'll turn it over to the applicant. Hi, can you hear me okay? All right. Um, I think if I switch to the presentation, are you looking at this right now? Can no, you? I have to share with you. So I'm going to make you temporarily a co host. Um, okay. But Danny, so um, let me just get to your. Here we go. Um, <coughs> Okay, um, so you should be co-host now, which means you can share your screen. So you have to click share screen. Oh, I see that button, thanks. Okay, so I want to share right there. If it will do it. Okay, can you see that okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so hi, thanks for having us tonight. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, my company, Pioneer Development, we're a small, local, mission-driven developer. We basically exclusively focus on green, energy-efficient, smart growth development. And by smart growth, I mean locations that are within walking and biking distance of downtown or other commercial centers. Um, and this is one of my early projects down here in the pictures. Um, we, we started you know, a, a little over a decade ago, we're a homegrown business. Uh, we began by buying a two family in Northampton and living in the first floor apartment while we finished the attic into a third floor apartment. And that's some of these pictures. Um, my kids still remember crawling up into that ladder up there in that little nook. Um, we've done a number of projects since then uh, in, the, in the decade that followed. Um, one of those was completing uh, Northampton's first Lead for Homes gut rehab project which earned gold certification it was a gut rehab of a single family home um, that's one picture from that is pictured on the bottom left and um, we've done another a number of other small projects and we're currently expanding um, current converting and expanding uh, the former vet clinic on south street to eight apartments three apartments in the original structure which is an 1888 structure um, followed by an addition of five townhomes to the back of that and I'm sure that a lot of you have seen that underway and hopefully almost at completion here. Um, so to, to just kind of go over a little bit, the over, an overview of the 36 Hamden pro, pro proposal. Um, you know, the city spent many years working on its sustainable Northampton plan, followed by many more years attempting to implement the sustainable Northampton plan recommendations um, into you know, regulations and, and other ways of implementing it. And one of the outcomes of that was the, um, the recent zoning changes that occurred in the city a few years ago. Um, and we think that this project is pretty, meets the, the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan pretty well. So I, I wanted to just kind of go over quickly at the beginning why, why I think, um, why we think that, that this really, really is a good fit with this plan. It provides additional housing types in a walkable neighborhood to downtown takes advantage of existing public infrastructure. So, you know, there's your efficient use of resources. It's energy efficient, uh, solar PV ready, we're improving water quality, um, and it's in a smart growth location that reduces driving. Um, from an equity standpoint, you know, what we're trying to do here in this, this particular project is we've specifically aimed to help alleviate housing price pressures in Northampton, not just through additional supply, but by directly trying to build a smaller unit that's more affordable to a median income household uh, so that more people can afford to live within walking distance of downtown where I'm sure you know, everybody has noticed how, how much those prices have risen in the last few years. Uh, from a design perspective, the proposed new building, and I'll get into this a little bit more in the next slide, the, the proposed new building that, that we have here is, is similar or smaller in scale to the surrounding neighborhood structures and has some traditional design elements that Jeff Penn, our architect, will talk about in just a bit. And the design includes shared open space, some gardening areas, open and covered bicycle storage, and capture of rainwater for irrigation. So just a number of sort of thoughtful um, green features and also just features to help it fit uh, well into the neighborhood and provide a really nice place uh, for people to live. 
So specifically what we're proposing, and you know, I'm sure everyone here has, has read the proposal, but we're proposing to add a small three unit townhome to a site that currently has a two unit townhome on it. Um, there's a kind of a large five car garage at the back that is shared between our property and 32 Hamden. So our portion of that garage, which is you know, almost kind of like a weird commercial structure in the middle of a residential neighborhood, is gonna come down and be replaced um, with a, a couple of parking spaces, at least that's what we're proposing. And so, you know, we're gonna be adding these three small townhomes and taking down this massive garage. So sort of the net new building footprint that we're putting on this site is 960 square feet. So that, that's about the footprint of a small ranch house. Um, it's located on an end lot of Hampton Street abutting Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary, but it's just a mile to downtown. So you know, from our vantage point, it's a you know, fantastic little spot. And you know, from a development perspective or a developability perspective, it's kind of nice that it has limited visibility from the street. Um, you know, this, the intersection of, corner of, of Reed and uh, Hamden where you know, most people are traveling. Um, and I'll show you some pictures in, in a moment. Um, but you know, really you can't see much of even the existing structure and parking, let alone the new proposed structure and parking on the site from the public street. As I said, uh, we've got sort of a low profile structure here because we were able to take advantage of building, uh, building it into a hill. So we're going down to walk out bedrooms instead of going up to a second story. And, um, you know, just sort of summarizing some of what's in the zoning analysis, you know, the zoning here allows for up to six units. So that would be four additional to the existing duplex. And, and the site could accommodate this if you really, if you really wanted to try, try you could make it work. But you know, we went through a conceptual design process and a feasibility assessment, looking at you know what is going to make good design here, and also what's going to be sort of financially feasible. And we concluded that basically we could make either two large top of the market units, so you know expensive uh, units, or three smaller, more affordable uh, units targeted to median area income <coughs> work well on this site. Uh, and just to kind of I know this is a lot on one slide, um, but the rest are mostly pictures. Um, you know, I just kind of want to say here that, you know, this proposed development, I have read all the neighbor letters. I, I spoke, I've, I've talked extensively with, um, you know, my closest neighbors and, you know, I've read all the neighbor letters. Um, you know, so, some of those folks I have I've not met personally, but, you know, a lot of what I read, you know, there's specific problems that, that people are, are citing, but really, I think the overall gist here is that people are saying this is, this is too dense, you know, this is out of scale density. And, you know, this proposed development is just adding one three unit townhome to the property. It's allowed by right with site plan review. And, you know, what is under review here is not actually the density that's allowed by the zoning. It's, it's how well the site plan works, um, you know, from a functioning standpoint, you know, how it's gonna operate, how it's gonna look from the neighborhood, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I actually I do want to make one more small point to this too. And that is originally, if you look at the survey that I submitted, um, you know, originally this was platted uh, with multiple lots and Hampton Street running all the way down. You know, so there was a, an idea at a time in the in not too distant past that this was going to be uh, developed further and there were going to be, you know, so, some more units on this, you know, so, you know, I, I think we think that this is a great example of the kind of you know small incremental infill development that's needed in the city to help reduce pressures on housing prices and make it more affordable for more people to live in the city. So saying all that to say, here are a couple of images that I took uh, from the public streets. So this is where people are traveling with their cars on Reed. A top left is sort of traveling towards Hamden from Reed Street. Um, that's this one. So you can see it's that little red, it's the red house at the back. You know, you can kind of see it through the hole there. And as you're approaching Hampton, it comes into view. Um, and then, you know, so this is sort of sequential. The bottom left, you're getting a little closer to the intersection. And here is, you know, a full view. So those two on the bottom are, are the full views really of what you can see today, um, which is gonna be no more, you know, no less than what you can see tomorrow. If we developed the site, you would see the same exact thing because you know the back building would be completely invisible, <clears throat> and all of the additional parking would be uh, completely invisible from this vantage point as well. I also wanted to just have a couple of slides here on existing conditions. I know a couple of you popped out to the site uh, this week. Uh, somebody told me so. You know, hopefully you all made it out there. Um, 
speaking to the planning board, of course. Um, but you know, so you know, right now this is this is what the site looks like. The bottom left is the five car kind of like weird commercial structure that's there now, and we're proposing to take down our two bays of that garage. So at least it'll come down to like a somewhat more normal massing for a structure like that, um, you know, in a residential neighborhood. Um, right now, it's kind of like a mucky mess of a driveway. People, tenants, you know, parked everywhere on this site, including in these pictures. You know, I used to see, you know, cars getting parked, you know, right here <coughs> on the way looking through to, you know, the trees there. Um, you know, there's a lot of stormwater runoff um, that we're going to be mitigating that's happening because this site is, is what you're seeing. Um, and, uh, you know, the bottom right is the existing building, and we are proposing some visual improvements um, to that as well. But, you know, I partly wanted to show this to you because this is not, you know, like a pristine country view. Um, I think what, you know, what we're proposing to do is really going to make this site look and function a lot better. You know, this is going to get, disorder is going to get replaced with order. There's going to be pavement and parking and, you know, planter boxes and three cute little houses and, you know, a lot of that knotweed and stuff that you, you see growing <clears throat> there six to eight feet is going to, you know, go away. Um, you know, so, you know, it's going to, it's going to be really nice and really cute. And I think it's going to fit well with this neighborhood. So just to give a quick overview of the site plan uh, from the aerial perspective before I pass it off to John Wallen, our engineer. Um, so, you know, what we're proposing here is, you know, this here is the existing structure. So this is the driveway coming in. This is the neighbor at 32 Hampton street. And then the neighbor um, on Reed, the next closest neighbor on Reed, you can't see his house because it's set up closer, you know, and he has a very deep backyard. So he's not, the structure isn't directly adjacent to ours. Um, so there's the existing one. Here is the proposed three unit townhome. And, uh, you know, what we're proposing is to remove this garage at the back and put in um, three parking spaces instead of that garage. And um, to cluster the rest of the parking spaces uh, sort of in front of and to the side of the existing <laughs> structure uh, where there is really already parking today. Um, you know, one little note on this is that we did look at, you know, we read the zoning and the design guidelines really carefully, of course. We did look at configurations that had parallel parking here instead along this. Um, and while there were some advantages to that, what we really didn't like about that was that it didn't allow us to create sort of a central open space here at the middle of the site where you know, both the neighbor would still get a peek through, so, you know, preserve some of that view, and also the residents of, of this, uh, you know, of the, the development, and also a place where we could just sort of put some kind of common space with some little community gardens, um, you know, so, so that was kind of how, how we came up with that, because if we turn those and make them parallel, we lose, we lose that, and we also, it would be more difficult to cite the bicycle parking. Um, in, in addition to this bicycle parking, we also have designed the site so each uh, unit individually has covered bicycle parking underneath their back decks. So they, so they have like a back deck that overlooks, um, you know, the wetland area, and then they have sort of a back deck or patio at the bottom, which is rainproofed uh, from underneath the, the, you know, the, the upper story back deck. And so they can, you know, cover, put a couple of bicycles there that would be in covered storage or when the weather's nice, there's um, you know, pretty significant open bicycle storage over here. Uh, we also have included planting areas that are fed by rain barrels, um, rain bar barrels with leaders going to each of them for each of the individual units. And then again, this little community garden open space area. Um, you know, so those are sort of some you know, nice, nice little features of the development. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to John Wallen our engineer on the project to discuss uh, the stormwater uh, a little bit, and then he will pass it off to Jeff after that. Um, you might need to unmute John. I, I don't know how that works. Can you hear me? Yep. You, you can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay, uh, my name is John Wallen, and I'm the engineer on the project. Uh, I mainly worked on the stormwater and the topography surveying, that type of stuff. Uh, I will go through the uh, stormwater uh, in a very general manner. Um, I'll talk about the existing conditions and then the proposed conditions and then some of the details of, of, of uh, the system and the benefits of it. Uh, so the existing condition on, on this slide, you can see a purple line that runs down through. Uh, that's a four inch uh, outlet from a very small catch basin in the corner of this property. Um, 
it's pretty undersized. Uh, it really won't even handle it, a 10 year storm. Um, so, uh, so what we're looking at, uh, uh, well, what it does right now is it should collect all of the, uh, the uh, runoff from 32 and 36 because it all runs in that direction. Um, however, uh, right now the city system along Reed Street is completely clogged and doesn't drain out of any of the drains that, that I looked at. So we're getting on this site currently all of the water from, from the street across Reed Street, north of Reed Street, all the way down that's on the right side of this road all comes to this drain. Uh, so what happens is uh, this basically overwhelms that little drain and there becomes a, a pond down at the bottom. And in addition to that, all of the sediment that comes down with it plugs that drain often. Um, so after uh, uh, any rain event, basically there's a pond in that driveway and it's, it's not paved, so it's a very silty pond. And right now there's no existing sediment control. So all of this sediment, if this drain, the drain's not working at the very moment. Uh, if it were to be unplugged, all of that sediment would run right down into the wetland, um, which really is what happens with the city uh, storm sewer as well, but, but uh, it, it doesn't help. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide. Okay, this is a, an overview of the uh, proposed system. The blue line is the city's uh, pipe, or, or our best estimation of where that pipe is. Um, the purple circle right in the lower left corner of the site is the drain inlet. Uh, that'll be a deep sump basin, which will catch most of the sediment, most of the coarse sediment. Uh, then that overflows and runs into an underground uh, chamber system, which is wrapped with a filter fabric, so that the only way the water can get out of that system is to go through the filter fabric. So this, so most of the sediment will be trapped right in this underground system, and that's uh, that's meant to be cleaned on a periodic basis. Um, and according to the uh, DEP's uh, uh, calculation methods, we should be getting about 80% of the sediment out of the water that goes into that drain. Um, the, the system itself um, then pipes into a control outlet, which is the red circle. And that basically limits the flow able to, to leave the system so that we're mitigating the storm at that point. And then it runs through the green line and down and connects with the city's pipe into the wetland. Um, the city is uh, proposing to replace that pipe and fix those drains. We're not sure what the timeline is uh, to do that, but we have been in uh, contact with DBW and discussing that. Some other stormwater related items, uh, mowing the knotweed, it does help the visual aspect, but it also gives us a little bit more of a filter strip running along the back of the of the uh, lot so that we have an opportunity to catch some more sediment that's running over land in that area. If we replace that with grass, replacing the knotweed with grass. Um, and I'm told if we just keep mowing that, the knotweed will only get to a certain height and grass will be able to take over. And after a couple years of mowing, uh, it's supposed to be able to uh, disappear as long as it maintained mowing. Uh, Danny mentioned the rain barrels along the front, which are the little brown circles on the, on the uh, front of the building on the north side. Uh, they give some peak flow reduction and also allow us to infiltrate whatever goes into those rain barrels. So overall, we're looking at improving the water quality uh, as well as uh, handling some of the quantity of it running into the wetland at, at one time. Um, there will be a, a maintenance plan registered with the city uh, uh, and that will have to be passed through DPW to their satisfaction before uh, we'll be able to get a permit on that. Uh, and that's about it for the stormwater.
And I'll pass it off now to Jeff Penn, the architect. Hey there, Jeff. Is he muted, perhaps? I saw him. There we go. Ah, now I'm not muted. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Penn. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've worked with Danny for some time now. And so uh, I, I appreciate what she's doing here. This, this particular project, um, just to sum, basically, I'll just summarize where we've, uh, you know, basically what you've already heard, but where we're at. And that is that in our analysis, we've determined that four units were, additional units were allowed on this property. And, you know, they could be of any scale. And as Danny has outlined, we wanted to reduce the scale of the uh, project for the site, as well as reduce the size of the units for affordability. And so we've got three units. Um, we've decided to make them kind of cute. We've stepped them back so that units get corners uh, with glass around. We created little porches that have character. Um, people will be able to sit out on a chair. We've created the balconies at the rear because this view into Arcadia is stunning and we think this is really going to be an amenity. Um, again, we also tried, now granted, uh, as you all know well, zoning uh, and setbacks kind of determine design and we were not able to create a large green open space in the center. But what we did do was at least keep the buildings separated so that there's green around the buildings and so there's gonna be at least some perceived air and light. And the neighbor who we are conscious of uh, is gonna still at least have a view down into Arcadia. Uh, so we've also tried to make sure that the material choices are good. We're going to, it's going to look like a collaborated, uh, typical New England structure. The one building on site that already exists that you've seen the pictures of is that 1970s garrison colonial that was built in suburbia, but not usually in an urban neighborhood like this. And so we're gonna at least dress it up a little bit and create some detail to it, which will make it a little bit more attractive. Put some columns on the porches and put some brackets on the overhang so that it actually looks a little bit more sensible. Um, again, I think that they've uh, uh, outlined, you know, our uh, attention to the water mitigation on site, which is really quite uh, important because this is right on the edge of Arcadia. And of course, this spring water was there <laughs> all the way up to uh, the property line. So we were conscious of it. And uh, I think John's done a very fine job of uh, mitigating the water. And again, we we're just proceeding uh, with good heart, hoping to help Northampton. Jeff, did you wanna, um, do you wanna flick me to fl just flick through these slides uh, with the elevation? Sure, sure, sure. That would, yeah, that's the view of the townhouses. And uh, just for scale, you know, they're not very large. They're less than 16 feet in width each. Um, so they, Again, we're trying to keep this as small as possible, but with charm and with character. Uh, we think they're gonna be very nice little places to live. Uh, so yeah, the, the, and you, as you see, you know, we're putting some trim and details. It's not just gonna be plain blank uh, faces. Uh, yeah, the west elevation is not bad because it does show how, the, how we've had to be very careful using the site grade so that we're making sure that we get plenty of windows <coughs> across these units um, on the end units. And one of the reasons for the step backs was to also make sure that the center unit gets corner, uh, corners that are nice. Um, and then the next slide just shows a quick little sketch of some of the detail we'd like to add to the old uh, faux garrison. <clears throat> That's what we've got. Could someone talk to the existing uh, plants and trees and the uh, proposed planting plan? Yeah, I can, I can start and uh, if anybody wants to jump in, Jeff or John, let, let just do so. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, we are trying to make these structures solar ready and you can see that there's not a lot of open space between them in the driveway. Um, you know, so we felt like what we really wanted to do was focus on planting areas that got good sun and roofs, especially single story roofs, um, that could get full sun. Um, you know, so, um, you know, we've got the planters, we've got the garden beds, and um, then we've just got this 
it's not shown in this one, it's shown in the planting plan, but you know, one little tree, um, you know, just up here um, to kind of create a little bit more visual separation, although you really can't see this that well from the street, but, but still between the two, um, you know, the two parking areas. And then of course at the back, you know, we're, we're mowing some of that, the knotweed down um, to create sort of a, a, you know, a better view and improve the stormwater quality. Um, and then everything back here, you know, is untouched, all the trees at the back of the site, obviously. So, you know, that, that's the, the essential plan. And a large cluster of trees by the, the current garage, those are coming down? Yes, that is the proposal. <clears throat> um, it was a, you know, there's sort of a cluster of Black locusts, I believe. John can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, black, black locusts. And you know, we had a, a tree person come out and saw some rot and thought that it wasn't going to be too far in the future that you know the largest one was just going to split off and fall down the hill anyway. Um, you know, that may or may not be the case. You know, if there's a different opinion, I know there's a way to you know make a payment into the city tree fund. Uh, you know, to mitigate. Um, any lot, you know, a loss of any large trees. So. Several of those trees are starting to rot, actually, and I think that uh, those trees are are likely going to go, whether this development is approved or not. I don't mm. see them. I don't see them staying. They're going to fall in that garage if, they, if the garage stays. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate that. That's somewhat of a subjective call, but thank you. Um, was uh, the applicant in receipt of the comments from the DPW, which were pretty extensive, and the Mr. Whalen and Mr. Penn got a chance to review those? Yes. I just looked at it about 10 minutes ago. Okay, and they're, pr they're pretty extensive. Um, yeah, we have to have some discussions. I think there's some misunderstanding, and I'll have to talk to whoever did the review. Great. Great. Um, Ms. McCann, you mentioned that there was a, a historical plan for this and you referenced in your application in lots 11, 12, 13, and 14. Right. Do you have any plan that, that uh, demonstrates those lots or could you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yes, but I don't think I can actually pull it from this computer. Um, you know, but basically they kind of, here's one, and then if you can see that there's another and then there's the third that kind of goes down, you know, far left. And then there's like a, another one at the end and Hampton Street stretched all the way down in, in this plat plan. Um, but then the city didn't end up accepting anything further than this point. So then that uh, kind of de facto became uh, split between the private properties on each side. Um, and actually, I guess, incidentally, we are planning to donate the bottom two lots to Arcadia. And, um, you know, they've indicated that they'll accept the donation. Thank you. Um, planning board members, before we turn it over to the public, do you have other technical questions to help clarify any of the points brought up by the applicant? So uh, traffic circulation, um, would they come, would cars, back out onto the street or turn around in front of the existing garage, which won't be there, which, how would you see that happening? Um, there's a turnaround designed right there where I'm pointing, where you can pull back and then pull forward. So that's the plan for that side. And uh, these cars are all capable of basically doing a, a two point turn. Um, to get out of there, these can do a two-point turn. Um, so we we threw some templates on it and and looked at it, and it seems like it would be you know a reasonable way to get out. We want people to be able to get out forward, obviously, not to back up into the street. How, two points. Um, can you explain that? Yes. So if you back up like that, are you following my cursor? And then you go out like that. That's one. And then this one is like that, or maybe for a larger car, you know, maybe you'd have to back up again and go out, but you can, you can. Basically, can I, can I interject? Yes, please. Uh, that, that, uh, the diagonal parking um, can back up almost to the guy's driveway across the street. And I, I don't have the number on the, this plan here, but uh, you'll see the part of the driveway in this picture. 
So that road is actually twice as wide as what we're showing on this. We're just showing the property line ending there. So the, there's nothing keeping that car from backing up toward that driveway and pulling onto the street. Just so like when he pulls out, he pulls out and goes over your property and gets on. So that the would be backing up into the street. No, the street actually ends. The street ends right, at, right here. At the property line. So who owns the, the property or the land to the, to the, I don't know which direction. Um, that how, is uh, the Reed Street property owner right here. I think six Reed Street. Um, I mean, I don't think it's necessary to back onto each other's properties, but like the practicality is, is that we probably, you know, we probably will, you know, um, unless we want to stick something right down the middle of the road. But then, you know, he equally will have then a, t a tougher time getting out of his driveway. So, you know, I don't know how practical it really is to do that. But, but I mean, I, I think it is possible, you know, based on what we looked at to get out of there without doing that if, if necessary. I would imagine most people who are parking here are going to back in so they can just drive right out. It's going to be a lot easier. That's true. That, yeah, to come in like that and then do that. Yeah, I, I could see that. Can, can you tell me what are the plans um, currently with the abutter at 32 Hamden and that, that driveway strip? How do you plan on delineating your end of your driveway and the start of their yard, their side yard? Well, you know, you can see that we decided to kind of increase their their yard a little bit there rather than put the driveway right up against the property line. So they've got a couple feet there. Um, and, you know, honestly, you know, this is sort of, I did read the comments from Claudia. Um, you know, we're, as, as I said, you know, we're happy to, to put any landscaping that would, you know, she would feel would improve it. Um, I think it's going to be cute though, and that the best configuration of this is is not to try to put a giant, like say, arborvitae hedge all the way across and make it feel all kind of weird and commercial. Like I think it's going to be cute and nice to look at, and so like the delineation point is kind of like, well, we've made her yard effectively a couple of feet bigger, and you know the driveway is showing sort of a delineation, um, you know, but we're happy to put other stuff there too, you know, on the two feet or a couple feet that we left there, or if she would like on her property. Um, you know, I would be reluctant to do like a huge, you know, visual screen. I don't think it's going to make it better. I think it would make it worse, but you know, we, we're certainly happy to do whatever, you know, whatever would, would make her, you know, happier about it. Thank you. Other questions, planning board. Danny, what did you guys think as far as, um, snow removal i know that was a big concern from everybody that wrote in and i'm looking at a picture on a different screen and currently you could almost put three cars side by side down there in that in that parking area um and it sounds like that's where they push all the snow so what was your thinking around that so yeah this this the snow has i've been aware of the kind of weird snow situation on hamden street since purchasing this property. Um, you know, the history, the historic way that the city has dealt with basically the snow on apparently all of Hampton Street and maybe part of Reed is they just plow it all down there and push it down into the wetland. <laughs> and so, you know, there are other places in the city where um, the DPW doesn't have a wetland to push all the snow from the entire neighborhood into. And they kind of you know, you, a lot of you probably live in the city, so you know that they sort of pile it up in front yards and push it to the side and like find little pockets for it along in the neighborhoods. And like that is actually the more typical way that the DPW deals with snow in a neighborhood when they're plowing, you know, not just having some, you know, wonderful bonus area wetland that they can shove everything into. So, you know, from my vantage point, the DPW, you know, we had to talk about it, but they, they need to stop doing that. Um, it's not like very ecologically sound practice anyway, and you know, start doing it the way they do it in the rest of the city. Uh, Jeff, uh, John, if you want to speak a little to the snow storage on the site. Um, um, well, I don't have a pointer, but basically all these, all the areas between the sidewalks would be snow storage on the site, um, including right near the bike rack and, and maybe the bike rack area. I don't know if you'll be using that in the winter or not, but uh, 
by that tree that you pointed out is another potential area to store snow. Basically, we're not, we don't have anything but a curb along, along that whole edge. So the snow could be plowed with an angle plow off into the side of the, uh, the grassed areas. And we've got, uh, we've got uh, guardrail around the edges so that our snow plow crew does not plow off into the wetland. Thank you, Melissa. Anyone else? Okay, well, we'll come back to the planning board in a little bit, but at this point, uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you folks for those slides. A little tough to see, a little small for all of us, but uh, I think we get the gist of it. Um, why don't we at this point open it up to the public? Um, and again, um, I'll, uh, just say to the public, we appreciate your, your participation. We look forward to your comments. Try not to repeat each other if you can. We did receive eight letters from the local abutters, which all the planning board members have read and they are public, part of the public record. Um, so um, with that being said, um, which among you would like to come to the podium? And I think our friend Carolyn how are we doing this, Carolyn? Are people raising their hand from the participant toolbar or? Um, so we don't have anybody that's called in. Um, it looks like everybody's online. So if um, they could either raise hands um, physically in front of the screen to indicate that they want to speak. Um, and George, if you can see. Sure. Um, can, all of those. Um, can we can we drop the presentation feature at this point and pull yes. it up if need be so we can see all the grid of faces? Okay. Yep. Okay. And um, and then just make sure that um, if people could please um, state their name and address for the record before speaking. Okay. Our first speaker. Um, I see Catherine, please go right ahead. I'm Catherine Halverson, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I live at 37 Harlow Avenue and my property abuts your, your three parking, lit two parking places, the parking places that are going to go where the garage is coming down. I have two concerns. One is that the water drainage, I think the garage, protects our property from water coming off of the street and coming down into our property. <clears throat> How are you going to ensure that the water doesn't drain from your parking places down into my property? There will be, I'll answer that. There will be a curb around that uh, concrete pad that's left afterward. Okay. If I'm understanding right, if you're talking where the garage is, right? Yes, yes. We live behind the garage. This is uh, Tom Talbot. I uh, own the property with Catherine. And yeah. So we're we're concerned about that, and we're hoping that that water, the paved the turnaround area, and the place where the garage is going to be taken down, and and that that water will be directed, you know, not onto our property, but down the. No, it, yeah, it will be directed toward that new drain that gets put in, and the whole all the paving will be surrounded with curbing. Oh, excellent. Uh, so, you, that, uh, so that it's captured. Good. Have you considered using the cement that the water can go through? Smith College has been experimenting with that kind of cement. Uh, interesting you should say that. We, we uh, started our plan with proposing some permeable pavement, but because the DEP regulations are such that uh, you can't do it within certain setbacks of buildings and, uh, and lot lines and foundations, we have no room on the site to really do that permeable pavement. Um, so that, so that has, we ended up taking that out. Okay, well, we were worried about water runoff. Yeah, I don't think uh, there'll be any going that direction. It will be, it'll, it'll be guided from all the impermeable surfaces should be guided down toward that, uh, toward that new drain. That's, that's the idea. 
we, we may have to modify that slab once it's uncovered if it doesn't pitch that way. It's supposed to pitch that way right now, um, but if it doesn't, then we're going to have to add a thin layer to make it happen. We also have a concern about the, uh, the plowing of the snow uh, in the, uh, the newly paved area where the garage is going to be taken down and a turnaround spot. Our, our property line is only six feet behind the existing garage there and we're right. if that snow can be cleared without piling up on our property. They, there will be a guardrail along that edge of the garage and all around that uh, turnaround area. Yeah. There'll be a guardrail to prevent a plow from being able to push it off of the curb. Excellent. Excellent. So it's going to be back bladed from there, uh, and that they have to back blade it from there out of those spots, and then push it in wherever they're headed with it, in which one, one of the spots. That's, that's the really good news. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. John, would you be willing to put a note on the drawings to the effect that if um, you know the the existing slab from the garage doesn't pitch correctly it'll be replaced and pitched so that it goes towards the new drainage system it's kind of on there already because i'm showing the drainage going in that direction i mean that's what i mean that's like putting a note on that says all the pavement will pitch toward the drain it's shown by the arrows already that that's the direction the water will flow off of it okay that's really uh, great thank you Okay, thank you very much. Someone else from the public? Claudia? You need to unmute. Just, you just- Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, I think you can hear me now. Yes, it's Claudia Chirichini from 32 Hamden. You've read my letters, you know what my concerns are. Um, I also would like to know about the um, loo overhead power line that seems to be uh, coming over my property at the southeast corner. And the water drainage is something that I would like to ask about as well. Uh, I saw in the plans you mentioned a seep that I have never noticed on my property, so I wanted to see if I could understand more clearly what you're referring to. And um, the replacement, the demolition of the garages, we spoke about that in the past. I know you are going to be fully responsible for whatever uh, structural repair might be needed in the future, but I would like to have that put in writing somehow. And in terms of the cuteness of the project, I don't dispute your design, but I also think that, you know, for at least a part of the year, there will be mostly snow piles that I would see. So I would like to have some possibly evergreen screening uh, in place. Um, and I do think that you should somehow find a way to replace the trees that you're going to take down with something maybe slightly bigger than the little planters that you have on your, on your drawings. I also think that we have not a pristine view there, nobody ever claimed that, but certainly a unique environmental area where a lot of creatures from the wetlands, the forest, used to sort of come up freely and obviously that will go. I don't know that this is the time in the history of our planet where we need to just further reduce the room that different creatures that than humans have. And maybe the density is not a concern in terms of strict regulation, but it is a fact that no density similar to the one you propose on that site is in the rest of the neighborhood. Thank you. So would the applicant like to respond to the idea about the sheep and also the location of the overhead wires at this point? I, I, I can handle the seat uh, question. Um, I'm not sure, I didn't think your property had anything on it from a seat. The seat is to the east and down over the bank where a lot of debris has been thrown. At the bottom of that debris, 
is where the seat is coming out of the ground. By and, the uh, garage? Were, excuse me? By the garages? It's behind the garages and to the south, or to the east and to the south of the garages, right where it's labeled on the drawings. Um, it's not up on, on uh, your property, I believe. Uh, you, you're in 32, correct? I am, yes. Okay, yeah, so uh, there may be more of it up underneath that debris pile, which is debris being thrown into the wetland. Um, but, uh, but down below, it's very evident. You can see the water coming out of the ground down there. If you walk back there and look down in, you'll, you'll see it. There's a couple of very big dead trees laying across it. Yeah. And if you walk out in that area, um, be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I've seen it. I've actually walked there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seemed from the stormwater narrative that it was in my property, but I might have misread. No, it's actually right on the plans. It's labeled there as a, as a seat. Uh, it might be called an unidentified stream. I, I don't have it in front of me. It's okay. It's kind of small, but that's all right. Small yeah. to see in the drawings. Yeah. Thank you. And the overhead wires. Uh, the overhead wires we revised and we may revise again. Um, <clears throat> we pulled them to the corner of the property. Um, the DPW had uh, concern about its location there. Uh, we're going to have to work that out uh, between all concerned parties, including Claudia. Um, they also uh, brought up some other issues. Uh, apparently, the sewer connector for Claudia's building goes on to 36 Hamden. Uh, at least that's where it was marked. The foreman, when he was out there, told us that, uh, that that was uh, just an approximate location. So we will have to dig and find that connector to see where it is and then get it moved to where it needs to go. Uh, Thank you. And we'll make sure to follow up about the uh, listing the idea of planting evergreens along that driveway line and the abutter property at 32 in. Uh, anyone else from the public? Raise your hand, come to the virtual podium. Hello, Christine Nolan. Just unmute yourself. Take off this red speaker. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did not know that we were going to be able to react to the presentation. I thought we just had to make a statement. So I would like to respond a little bit, um, but I wasn't, I don't have them. I'm not as good talking off the top of my head, but there are just a couple of things I want to say. Um, and ask, um, has the conservation permit been um, given? Carolyn? Yep. No, it hasn't. Um, yeah, the um, uh, Conservation Commission has not scheduled a hearing yet. There's some more information that's required. Um, I, it's a completely separate jurisdiction. So if Conservation Commission grants a permit or if it doesn't grant a permit, even if the planning board grants a permit, the project can't move forward without both permits. Um, so it's really up to the applicant to determine which permit process to go through first. Um, but no, uh, that hearing has not taken place yet. And Thank it's not you. scheduled. So it could be a long time? Yeah, I, I don't know. It depends on when the information um, is required information required to um, move the project forward is submitted and how long it takes for um, DEP to review that. It could be a couple months. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask, nothing was mentioned about encroaching the buffer zone and um, can, of, of the wetlands and I wondered if somebody could speak to that. That again is under the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. So okay. they would have to approve that. Okay. But they um, did, if I might, they did note it on the plans where the buffer zone is. And I, there's no construction at this point that is projected to be within that buffer area. 
or the 100 foot flood plain. But you're right, all of that again will be reviewed by the Conservation Commission. Okay. Um, a, a couple other things that came to my mind as I was listening. Um, I heard a lot of very smooth talking. It was a very nice presentation. Um, I find it a little bit ironic to hear about the wonderful views that the new residents are going to have of Arcadia when in fact you will be taking away and removing the views of the close neighbors in this um, neighborhood. Um, including Claudia, and I, I don't call a 12-foot opening between the two buildings um, an, um, keeping a nice view for her. Um, so I just found that a little ironic to listen to. And I thought the snow removal explanation was not, um, was inadequate, and um, I, I cannot, I could not follow it with my mind because what I see is going down one side of the driveway on the right hand is full of buildings except for a 12 foot opening and a couple of parking areas. And then the other side is all another person's property. So I don't see how snow can, can be removed or pushed up um, against the front doors of, of the existing properties. I, I, I did not find that explanation very adequate. And as far as backing out into a neighbor's driveway, um, well, what if the neighbor is home and in that driveway? So suggesting that someone back out of one of the new parking spots and into the neighbor across the street's driveway um, does not sound like a good answer to me. Um, again, I, I believe that this is, this project is overfill, not infill, and it's far too much for this little tiny sweet piece of land. And I'm, I'm very opposed to it, and I hope you deny it tonight. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Nolan. Thank you. Claudia, just wait a moment, see if we have anybody else who'd like to speak for the initial time. Uh, Ms. Arata, if I may. Thank you. Um, I just have one question. I heard uh, so excuse reference. Me, excuse me one minute. Could you just give us your address? Yes, the... I'm at 18 Hamden. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I heard reference to a DPW review uh, and that uh, the gentleman who was speaking to it said he had only seen it 10 minutes ago and it was referenced that uh, it was rather extensive. What happens at this point? Uh, when does that get uh, studied and responded to? Um, it seemed like it just went off into vapor. Uh, thank you. That's a good question. Um, in a hearing like this, if the DPW hasn't provided feedback in a timely way, we do need to give the applicant time to respond to them. So one of the options is perhaps we do not close the hearing tonight. We allow the applicant to revise their plans and talk with the DPW in order to make sure they're on the same page about those issues. If the planning board feels like the the applicant's able to address those tonight and we can comfortably move forward, then we will. So there are two options there, but you're right. There hasn't been a lot of time for the applicant to really work through those and to revise the plans in a way that the DPW would be comfortable with. Carolyn, Thank do you, you want to add anything to that? So, um, Typically, I mean, sometimes there are lots of little minor details about utility adjustments that need to be made um, and recommended by the Department of Public Works. I, in this case, there were um, there was a request to have modifications um, presented for the stormwater system, which is is a little bit more significant than their typical utility um, modification recommendations. So um, I think it makes sense for the, um, since the applicant just received those comments earlier today, that, um, that 
any kind of adjustments and discussion that the applicant wants to have with Department of Public Works should happen and, and the board should give that opportunity to the applicant um, by continuing the hearing um, ultimately to, to provide that time um, for those details to be um, worked through so that the board understands exactly what the final uh, design of that stormwater system will be and the locate and make sure there aren't any conflicts with other utilities because those were other comments that were raised in the DPW comments and just so everyone knows those comments are posted in the public file cabinet so if um, anybody wants to go and look at those those are available um, I will also say that there are lots of little details that are typically worked out um, prior to issuance of a building permit. So they're not necessarily needing to be addressed before the planning board closes the hearing, but then there are another set of issues that do need to be addressed before the planning board closes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else from the neighborhood? Hello, Ms. Reynolds. I'm Molly Reynolds. I live at Four Reed Street. So my backyard is, you know, has a has a good view of this property. My main concern with this possible development has to do with the increased vehicles that with 12 bedrooms back in that on that parcel and eight parking spaces, I think that's what it is, eight allowed for. It's possible that there could be quite a few. Uh, vehicles that don't have a place to park on that property, which, you know, where will they park? And um, so that's one of my concerns is excess cars for the property that don't have an allotted uh, parking spot. And the other, the other is just it's a very quiet neighborhood. Um, and there, there are areas where there aren't sidewalks and there are children and dogs and what have you, um, leash dogs, of course. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it just think it, this could have a, a quite an impact on our corner of the world here. So, you know, my concern is the vehicles. Thank you. Does the applicant wanna respond to that around parking? Yeah. Um, so you know we've been managing properties around the city for the last decade and you know in our experience with two and three bedroom units one and a half cars per per household is a has been a good number that has worked really well um you know we're providing one more than is strictly required by the city ordinance because we feel like that was a little less than this was actually going to need um you know so you know, based on our own management experience the fact that these are very small units they're going to be some of them are going to be maybe single person or you know smaller households you know and even sometimes you'd be surprised even bigger units sometimes you only have one person occupying you know three bedrooms so like the way these kind of average out is you know one and a half cars per uh per unit of, of these kind of sizes and bedroom types is you know what we've seen over the years um you know as far as what is adding to the neighborhood you know when when you add more households you do add more cars that is going to be one of the effects of adding more units within walking distance of downtown um, that is going to be unavoidable. Um, but what I will say is that I looked at uh, Hamden Street has nine units on it. And then I looked at just the portion of Reed Street that's kind of between Hamden and, Char and Charles and that has five, you know, so those are 14 all over a thousand square foot units. So, you know, that's going to be from the city standpoint, 28 vehicles are currently traveling in that little zone. You know, probably some people are cutting over from Charles Street, going around the corner, that kind of thing too. Um, you know, so we're talking about going from, you know, 28 to 32, you know, so it's, you know, incrementally, you can't get any smaller than this from an, from an infield perspective, you know, it, it's, it would be difficult to get smaller than this and actually able to make it, you know, pencil out, so. Thank you. Um, Ms. Van Goyler. Okay, Just done. Um, thank you. My name is Ruth Von Goyler and I'm at 24 Hamden Street. Um, and um, I guess I 
wanted to reiterate, I'm, I'm sorry, I know we're not supposed to be iterative, but um, I, I too was not really convinced about the snow removal plan. And I hope that I, I really urge all the planning board members, if you haven't been over to the site to look at it, the photos I think we saw tonight were taken with a wide angle. If you visit the site, it does not feel like a spacious site where we have a lot of room to navigate. And um, the property drops off in the back, on the side, pretty much everywhere where you'd want to put snow. And all those areas drop into the wetlands that um, you know, are, are very uh, sensitive. Um, I would also say you know, things like our 100-year floodplain and um, wetland areas are changing you know, year to year. So in the 15 years that we've lived here, we've seen that area get wetter and wetter back there. And so I think the, the wetlands are just gonna get closer and closer to that property. And the, what's now the 100-year floodplain is definitely gonna move up as uh, we see climate change um, you know, wreaking havoc. So my, my real concern with this is it is about the snow removal, the, I, I'm very um, sad to hear that you couldn't use those pavers, and I, I, I really do appreciate all the kind of green efforts you're making on this project. Um, but um, I, I, that, that those pavers would have mitigated a lot of the runoff that we're now going to, new runoff that we're now going to see from where we have soil now, it, you know, if like, it seems like a large chunk of that usable, the buildable, lot the lot looks huge of course on paper but the buildable lot a, a large part of it is going to be paved and so that that is a concern that all that runoff will go and and you know cars are polluting you know <laughs> that runoff is going to include every oil leak that we have and everything else um and i guess i had a technical question about the drain that you guys are proposing i'm not sure um if that is like a private drain and I heard mention of needing to to clear that out yearly, and who who exactly is doing that um, is a question. Um, and I guess finally, and, and and maybe this was the big crux of it for me is like I don't quite understand why. It feels to me like um, there's with eight cars on that property, you're kind of wedging yourself into all these problems. What if what if Ian moves and the neighbor next door doesn't want to share that driveway? Um, I, I, I'm not really convinced that that's a two-point turn at all. I think it's a back into um, further north on Hamden Street kind of turn and then, you know, and, and getting out. And right now where the two units are on the south side of the two parking spots on the south side of the house is exactly where the snow gets plowed these days you know and that um that is being taken that space is now being occupied by not one but two cars um so th that's a, those are all big concerns that um the scale of it is just a little bit bigger than what i would like to see i'm a infill proponent but i um, wondering, you know, I know you consider four units. I wondered if you ever considered just adding one or two units, um, which would feel a little bit more to scale in the neighborhood and, to, and definitely to scale for that small property. Thank you. Thank John, you. do you wanna start by trying to address some of the, the snow removal and stormwater stuff and then I'll pick up after you? Yeah, well, the snow removal, we've already gone over um, what the plan is. So that's the same thing I said before. Uh, the uh, drain is a private drain, and there will be a uh, operation and maintenance manual, a contract basically with the city that the developer will have to take care of uh, the maintenance of that and cleaning out it, cleaning it out periodically and uh, inspections uh, an engineer will have to look at it once a year um, so it's a constantly monitored private system so just for clarification then is is this not so this is not going to be private homes it's going to be a developer run um, no, it, it will be kind of so so how is the developer going to be cleaning the that that drain out in years to come 
I mean, you guys won't be involved with it anymore, right? The condo association docs fill out uh, the continued maintenance and I would be available to, you know, essentially do it for them um, after the fact, you know, on a you know, certain basis or they could hire somebody else to do the maintenance for them. Um, but, you know, in their condo docs, they would have their maintenance program. So, sorry, will the city have a contract with the developer or with the future condo occupants about this maintenance? It would be with whatever owner is current. I mean, it, it's not a contract between the city and the owners. It's something that will be written into the legal condo association docs for any purchaser of, of one of the units. So upon purchasing, they are agreeing to do the things, you know, in the, in the documents that govern the condo association. And where does the city have a say in that? Where does the city come into play? I mean, is the, the city is requiring maintenance, right? So does oh, the city right, so yeah. if, the, if, what's written in the condo contract if, or whatever if, it is? If I might, so this is somewhat standard for stormwater management plans for the city. Um, a developer, a homeowner, a commercial business on King Street writes, <clears throat> develops a pretty specific maintenance plan of how they will maintain those kinds of systems. And that's filed with the uh, DPW and the city. And, you know, those need to happen. They're monitored by the building inspector or by someone from the DPW as much as possible to make sure that that happens. Um, so they are somewhat pro forma around these kind of new situations. Well, and especially, you know, we're not, I, I am not crazy about the underground retention system that was discussed where most of the silt will be captured. I think Mr. Whaler said 80% of the silt will be captured in the underground retention. That That's will that will demand a lot of maintenance. So um, I think it's certainly the uh, burden will be on the association to make sure that that happens or it will back up. It'll flood the driveway. The tenants, the homeowners will be very upset. Um, so that's kind of the course that it runs with these maintenance plans. Uh, could, could the developer also address the, the uh, question about whether uh, a smaller number of units was considered? Yeah, um, you know, as I mentioned in the first slide, when we did the feasibility assessment, we kind of came up with two scenarios that we thought would work well on the site, you know, and one of them was um, a two unit scenario. And, you know, we chose to go instead with the three unit scenario, because in order to make the two unit scenario work, it would have to be two very large expensive units, um, basically sold at the top of the market. Um, you know, pretty close to 500,000 um, in, a, in a two unit, you know, which, or separating them into two, you know, individual single structures, um, you know, would probably, you know, even go above that point if, if that were done, you know, versus trying to sell three smaller units that are targeted to people who, you know, can, who, who make the median income for the city who can afford them, you know, so we we decided to elect to go for sort of the, the shorter, lower profile structure and targeting the units to, um, you know, sort of closer to the mid threes where median income households could afford it. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public before we go back to Claudia? Hello, Brian. <laughs> Hi, that's me. Yes, I live at Two Reed Street, and my driveway is directly across from where this proposed project is going to be. Um, most of my concerns have been addressed by my wonderful neighbors, and um, my main concern at this point has also been addressed, but there's a snow removal, which has been a problem ever since I've moved here over 12 years ago. And um, the city has plowed snow down the end of Hamden Street, and in certain winters, they've had to remove it with a backhoe because there just wasn't enough room to push all the snow that they were piling up. Um, also, the snow removal um, people who worked for my, my neighbor um, sometimes plowed the snow into my yard, as has city plows as well. 
When that snow melts, it seeps into my basement, which has become problematic. Um, I've had to go out and speak to each snowplow driver and kindly ask them to please don't plow the snow into my yard. And from practical experience, I can tell you that the snow stacks up very, very quickly. And I don't see how that snow is gonna be plowed somewhere else without being removed, unless it's plowed into my yard. Thank you. And we will certainly have more discussions with the uh, applicant um, before the hearing is closed about uh, more specific snow removal plans, I'm sure. Yeah, it just doesn't seem feasible, but maybe it is, I don't know. I have had some discussions with the city DPW about this issue of plowing all the snow to the end of the street, you know, and I think they're they starting to recognize that they need to change and distribute better across the neighborhood and that they can't, you know, the end of Hampton Street never actually even got taken by the city. So they're taking kind of a whole neighborhood worth of snow and putting it onto private property. You know, so they, they really can't continue to do that. They're going to, we're going to have to work together for the city plows to come up with a better plan that as they do in many of the urban neighborhoods of our city, they have to, they don't always have such a convenient, you know, toilet to flush it down. So, you know, I think we're just gonna have to work with the DPW to, to, to not have them be putting the entire neighborhood there anymore, or at least that one street. Anyone else before we go to the folks who wanna speak a second time? Okay, Catherine Halverson. Well, we're talking about all this snow buildup on the street. Now, it won't affect me because I use uh, Harlow Avenue, but we have a problem over here when there's snow buildup and there's cars parked on the street, you can't possibly get an ambulance down to our house. You can't possibly get a fire truck down to our house. Getting those big uh, service vehicles when you're putting more cars on the street, in addition to snow, seems pretty risky to me. Thank you, Ms. Halverson. Uh, Christine Nelson, Nolan. Uh, yes, I just wanted to, Danielle, to talk a little bit more about, you said, we have to have a conversation about snow removal on Hamden Street. And I'm wondering who, who is going to be responsible for making that new plan? Because you're going to sell these units and you're not living anywhere around them. So how is that going to happen? Uh, I, I worry that you'll be gone and there'll be this big problem and other people will be left to try to deal with it. Um, I think I'll be, you know, helping to get the get things up and running and managing the property for a while. I live in town. I'm not far away. Um, you know, so I think it's just going to take an ongoing effort with, you know, the planning, the DPW to just talk about how they can, you know, no longer push all the snow onto private property, essentially, or distribute it a little better across the neighborhood. And Ms. Nolan, the the planning board has heard the neighborhood concerns and I'm sure we're gonna spend more time and make sure that the planning board is satisfied too with all those conditions before we close. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Claudia. Yes, this is about the snow removal and DPW again. I mean, really DPW has not just been pushing snow into private property or less so into the wetlands. DPW had made an agreement with the previous owner of that property so that just a part of the snow cloud away from Hampton Street would be pushed way <coughs> before the buffer zone. And the mountain, the pile of snow was actually closer to the street than to the whatever you now call a paper street than it was to the um, forested area. Uh, so much so that oftentimes during a snowstorm, I would offer one of my garage bays to the renters of Miss the Yetz so that they could park there since they had no place to park because DPW pushed the snow where they used to park, not into the wetlands. Okay. So 
this is something that will not be part of the plans moving forward. Um, and the applicant's very aware of that. And they're gonna <clears throat> have to make very concrete conditions, whether it's through DP, DPW, some formal thing or something to the dean. So, and with that, if this does go through two of the, uh, the new homeowners will not certainly put up with that situation from the city anymore either. It'll mean problems for their vehicles. So, but I appreciate your comments. Okay, we'll probably want to start to wrap up the public comment period so we can, the planning board can have a discussion and have some more details with the applicants. Are there any last comments? Anyone who hasn't come to the podium yet? Can I just say, sorry, one, one more little thing about this, this snow plowing issue is we're, we're kind of butting heads now against a non-conforming lot, right? Like this is a lot that has virtually no frontage. And this is why I think it's an issue if you're trying to put five units suddenly on a, on a lot that has no, no frontage of its own, where is the DPW supposed to plow, plow that snow, right? Like, and, and, and so I just wanted to, to point that out. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okie doke. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Nolan, last, last chance. I just want to say thank you very much to the planning board committee members who have made a visit to the site recently. I appreciate that so much. And I think it spoke volumes when you went and saw it as compared to what you see on paper. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Okie doke. So let's not close the public hearing yet in case we need to, uh, talk to the applicant, but uh, planning board members, do you have other questions about the proposal? George, I have two questions um, that I didn't hear discussed in full. One is refuse removal and the plan for um, trash removal and storage and recycling bins or whatnot. And the other one would be um, if the applicant has considered dropping the new electrical service uh, below grades since the whole site will basically be um, torn up. Danny, do you want to speak to that? You're on mute, Danny, Ms. McCann. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I can talk to that. Uh, let me see if I could pull that plan back up and screen share it. Um, hold on. There we go. Just so we're looking at something here. All right. Can you see that sort of? So um, we sized a trash and recycling area at the back of the site here. So it's sort of like a covered, um, you can see in the application packet, but like a sort of a covered bin area. And um, you know we anticipate um, pedal people service to the site. It's sized for five units, so that's back there. And you know as far as the um, electrical, the you know they're going to do um, a pole extension in order to be able to service this site. And you know National Grid isn't willing to put it underground, and that's the most unsightly part of it is what's over on the public in the pe public realm. You know at the intersection of um, of Reed and Hamden Street, you know, so that's not something that the utility company budgets and from a, you know, resilience standpoint, if you could knock out the lines up there, because none of the city lines are, are buried, you know, other than increasing the cost of the project, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of utility to, um, you know, to basically having it above all the way up to the private property and then bringing it below, you know, because the utility company is unwilling to bury their lines. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're thinking that, you know, it, it drives up the cost and doesn't really add very much when the utility wires, including the new one that we're proposing are all going to be above, above ground. Jeff, I know uh, you had you possibly have some thoughts on that as well. Feel free to jump in if you want. Hi. Yeah. Um, no, you, you know, we can't solve that one immediately because we do have to negotiate with the uh, utility company. What, what we wanted to talk about was the fact that 
if the city is intending to reconstruct or at some in some manner repair the uh, uh, stormwater drains along the street. That would be the appropriate time when the street is disturbed to do such a thing out in the public realm. But as Danny says, we don't have the ability to, to do so privately. We could, um, like I say, we could negotiate with uh, the city and the utility company for the possibility of doing that in the future. Um, again, we're just going to have to really look carefully at where the poll goes. I wasn't involved with that discussion with you and John, but I can speak a little bit to it in that we had tried a couple of different locations on the plan. One of them uh, turned out to be pretty close to the property line along the double parking area. That seems to be the nicest location to keep the lines away from the neighbors. However, the DPW did comment that that wasn't, how are you gonna protect the telephone pole from, from traffic. So again, that still has to be worked out, but we are thinking about it. So from my point of view, yes, it's something that I think we should continue discussing with you. The developer certainly has within their right to provide a buried transmission lines for all those utilities. It would be a bonus for the abutter who um, would not have to see those lines above ground across that site. <clears throat> that you are trying to preserve for them. That would be bonus number one in terms of resiliency when it be, when we have storm, the storms that we're experiencing now, um, lines of course that are above ground um, are inherently kind of in danger of being knocked down. Um, so I don't think the applicant has to wait until the whole street is redone in order to site a transformer. Um, but I think we should um, think about that option of citing a transformer rather than a pole that can then start the um, underground lines. And as Melissa pointed out, that whole yard is going to be torn up with sewer, um, out, outfalls, um, the whole retention system. And those two things might be able to happen at the same time. Other questions from the board? Has there been any discussion about the sidewalk, extending the sidewalk to your, um, to the new homes, to the area there? I don't no. think there's any sidewalk here. There isn't a sidewalk on that end of Hamden Street to extend, so it would require um, a couple of properties worth of work. Um, Seems like it's just kind of the end lot and sort of like a, a, you know, a shared drive sort of a thing where, you know, we've got a little driveway serving a few units at the end. Um, so I don't, I don't know that a separate sidewalk is necessary, but I also don't know what we would connect it to. The sidewalks on the other side, the west side of uh, Hamden Street. The west side, I think. So it would have to go across other people's private property to connect it. Okay. You, there was a note in the plans that you would uh, <clears throat> install tree protection during the construction period. But if I understand it correctly, all the trees are coming down on the lot. What trees would you be protecting? And that's not a trick question, but. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak to that. There's a cherry tree behind the garage. Yeah, I think I can get it right there uh, and, the, and then we were asked to protect the shrubs and i understand i understand that the that the uh, tree warden has some comments but i have not seen them yet on the tree protection i think the only tree you have proposed now um <clears throat> is that small dogwood tree. Um, I would certainly would like to see the applicant try to envision where some other trees could be planted. 
that could uh, kind of flesh out that yard a little bit. Um, I understand you're holding on to some kind of garden area and you want to preserve the roof lines for a possible PV array. Um, but if you're not installing a PV array, um, we don't know if that'll happen. Um, I'd like you to perhaps think about other trees that could be planted within the project footprint. I have a question about trees. Um, I gather you're, you're proposing, as I understand it, to take down the very, very large uh, locust tree by the corner of the existing garage. You said that you think it's in bad condition and will likely fall. Um, but I think the tree warden um, doesn't agree with your assessment and that that will have to be discussed. Is there any possibility of retaining it? I don't, I don't think that there is a possibility of retaining it. We did have a, um, an iteration where we attempted to retain it, but then, you know, really to get that turned around, it was going to cut into the root zone, you know, and compromise it further. And, and it is already compromised. Um, you know, I did take a look at the tree warden's comments a few minutes before the meeting. And, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if he doesn't agree with the, um, the assessment that we, that we got from an arborist, um, we can, you know, make the, the necessary payments uh, into the city tree fund. There's no way of dealing with the turnaround in a way that will preserve the tree. I gather the other, in, in back of that area, it, you're not having any construction and you're removing the impervious cover or the existing concrete uh, floor of the garage. So it doesn't seem like you're making a lot of changes around the root structure. John, do you recall, um, do, or can we pull up, <laughs> be easy, better to pull up an existing plan um, to uh, take a look at this. But, you know, my recollection of it was that that tree was, you know, the canopy was kind of like this. And so like any new pavement in here, if we redo the pavement and also this turnaround would, would really cut into the drip zone of the tree, you know, which is, you know, where the roots are. We could attempt to protect it anyway and hope for the best, but it might then come down. Yeah, I'm not an arborist, so I, you know, I can't speak to whether that's healthy for the tree or not. Uh, I just know what we were told. I think the issue is, if I could just clarify, that the tree warden um, feels like that's a healthy tree and has a long life ahead of it. So removing it, it's not a, a matter of trying to save it because it, it, there's extensive work being done within the root zone. It's just a matter of whether or not the board would approve um, a waiver of the replacement based on the hazard condition. And so his assessment was it's not a hazard condition tree, so therefore it would require tree replacement. And so it's is really more about that as opposed to whether or not it could be saved. I mean, I'm happy to have an arborist back out and you know cross-reference that tree with the plan. Um, we don't really have a lot of wiggle room on the turnaround, but I'm happy to ask him if he thinks there's a, a feasible way that we could protect, truly protect that tree um, and, and keep it there. You know, I prefer it to stay as well. Um, you know, so I, I'm happy to do that. And then, you know, the trash is easy enough to relocate. It's not large somewhere else on the site. We can figure that out. I mean, it might be just as well to, um, we ha there has not been a lot of success around the city with projects where the applicant has said they would save trees and there's construction even for parking areas within the critical root zone. Right. And so I'd hate to see that um, happen. In fact, the board has a conversation later tonight about this very same issue about a tree that was supposed to be protected and it's failed. Yeah. Um, it may be better to plant another tree there um, at the you know edge of the parking area so that it grows up in the context of 
that parking pad as opposed to trying to save the existing tree. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that and decide what makes the most sense um, there. And regarding the, uh, the trash dumpster, I don't think it's so much a, an idea of relocating it, though it might be, but it's, I think, a, a caution on our part that uh, one of the larger dump trucks, Waste Management USA, doesn't all of a sudden get a contract from the association to come in there because um, it just couldn't, the, the site can't handle that kind of vehicle. So somehow we have to work that into the conditions, I believe. Okay, planning board members, anything else? George, is this an appropriate time to talk about um, just uh, construction? Um, Restrictions, or is that a something different? No, I think this is a fine time, Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. Just while we have all the um, abutters um, joining us, um, thinking about the construction that's going to happen down there and the limited site, you know, um, I think we should add some language somewhere stating that you know uh, construction vehicles cannot be outside of the limit of the project works. Um, they can't be parking up on Hamden and Reed Streets. Um, construction vehicles like to show up at uh, 6.30 and sit and idle their trucks, um, which drives the neighbors crazy. Um, so I think we should try to put some restrictions around that. Yeah, I'm not sure I would agree with that. I, I think going further than <clears throat> the limitations that the law imposes, I don't, not sure I feel comfortable telling people where to park when they show up for work. Um, I, yeah, and who's going to enforce it? I, I, you know, tell people they can't, I mean, hopefully they won't idle their car. They shouldn't do um, that for other reasons, but. So I've seen it written in other places, Alan, and again, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I've, I've seen it written in other conditions um, and even on projects that I've worked on where um, it's even over at Smith College, um, the trucks are all sitting there idling at 630. Um, you know, a lot of times we require people to carpool from a distant lot, um, only to have one vehicle per company on site because it, it really does affect the neighborhood in a pretty detrimental way for even if it's that short period of construction time, if there isn't some sort of regulation or restriction over it. Hmm. I, I just can't I help it. Oh, sorry. I guess I'm, it's not definitive one way or the other, but I don't think we've ever imposed a condition like that um, on, I mean, the same thing would apply to every single construction project of any residential or commercial building. Uh, we, uh, that's taking a step that I don't think we've ever done before. Well, Alan, I, I think it's specific to kind of these, these neighborhoods that are tight. I think, to be quite honest, we probably missed it on our last public hearing that we can't go backwards on. Um, but uh, I think we just want to ask the applicant, perhaps, if they've had any experience with any of these um, mitigating things during construction period that they could offer to the neighborhood. So you're specifically proposing that construction vehicles are not allowed to park or idle on any public street? Is that what is on the table here? I'm trying to understand exactly what the restriction is that you're proposing. Um, if I could just interject, I think the planning board at some, for very, very large projects that are abutting neighborhoods, the planning board had, and the one instance I can think of is really the Smith College example. They think, Melissa, that you mentioned um, that was for the engineering building um, and a lot of um, structures were coming down in the Green Street neighborhood so that was a very I think 
I would suggest that might be more of a unique circumstance because it was a very large commercial project happening in a neighborhood. Um, I think the board need, should probably focus on, uh, there are regulations that dictate when construction can start and what construction period during the day. And that's enforceable by the building department and the police department, although that might be changing now in our new, um, um, new policy shifts. But at any rate, there, those things are in place. And I think to speak to what Danny was suggesting, I don't think the planning board can say construction vehicles can't park on a public street. Um, and typically these, these smaller construction projects are pretty time limited and they can be, you know, seem unbearable for the moment in a year that they take place. But typically the board is focused on decisions about the site and the long-term function of the site and not so much the construction unless there is a particular or unique circumstance that um, makes sense, like it's gonna be, you know, a 12 or 18 month kind of um, build out or something like that. I will say if I could sort of add here, you know, we are planning as we did at South Street to do modular construction. And so, you know, for those who are watching it carefully, you know that we set five units over the course of two and a half days. So, you know, it all goes up pretty fast, um, but you know, those two days are intense for sure. You know, there's gonna be some vehicles on the street, you know, trying to coordinate it and, you know, figure it out. So it would be hard on those, those specific set days to be able to promise, you know, that no construction vehicles are gonna be anywhere, but it's only a couple of days. In this case, this is um, probably a one day set would be my guess. Um, and then, you know, all the finished work that we're saying that we don't want the modular company to do or that they can't do. Um, and, you know, also the, the finishing of the existing basements is all gonna basically be done by a couple of guys, you know, a couple of construction people, you know, it's not, it's not a big project, you know, so, you know, a few people, but it's not gonna be a huge, huge cruise or anything, you know, and, and they'll basically be able to park on site. Okay. Very good. So I think what we hear is we leave it to the neighbors if construction vehicles block their driveway or if construction starts before 7 a.m. by city guidelines that they need to get in touch with the building inspector or the police at this point um, in order to kind of file a complaint. Okay. Anything else, folks? I think we're at a, a place where we need to decide whether or not to continue the hearing. Um, whether to keep the public portion of the hearing open so we can hear from the applicant again. Can we take down the shared screen so that yeah. uh, we can see yeah. everybody? Thanks. Um, and just so on that note, um, if you feel like you need more information, um, particularly as it relates to um, how the DPW comments can be addressed, um, in particular, maybe about stormwater, then continuing the hearing means that the public portion of that, the public hearing is open still. Um, and certainly with plan changes, you'd wanna make sure that the public has an opportunity to respond to those plan changes. So um, if the board feels that it's appropriate to continue the hearing, then that continues everything with it um, to another date and time. Thank you. So if we were to do that, along with the uh, applicant's responses to the DPW, the stormwater plan and other questions, we would want to provide the applicant with any other conditions we thought, information that we thought we needed before we met again, the planning board. So that might be around <clears throat> um, language more specific language and and discuss it on the snow removal and kind of uh having that noted on the plans this is what i've taken so far um some kind of agreement around the the payment to the tree fund in northampton for the removal of certain trees um the, any kind of plantings to be shown on the planting plan between the abutter at 32 Hamden 
and the new project lines. Uh, some kind of language about the uh, trash removal that precluded large pickup pickups from uh, the big industrial fellas. Any other conditions, um, information that the board feels they need? George, I just want to make some one comment about the snow removal issue. I may be missing something, or but but I have a bit bit of a different view of that. I I just don't see it as an issue. The DPW cannot legally push snow onto people's property. They can't do it now. They can't do it after this project is completed. And the owners of the um, five units, whether it's the developer or a condominium association, cannot legally put the snow from the property onto neighbor's property. I, I, I just don't see if they don't have room to plow the snow and deal with it on the property, they'll just have to truck it away. That's their problem. Uh, so I just don't see it as an issue either way. So good point, Alan. Um, I think we need to hear that and explicitly the city has been doing that. And I, in order to protect the neighbors who live on Hamden Street, we need to know that that's not going to happen again. Well, but, the so, DPW well, but I don't, I, yeah, I don't the know DPW. that I agree that it, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I don't know that I agree that it, it ought to be on any particular property owner, whether this, you know, new developer um, or any of the existing property owners to, to, to be the ones responsible for compelling DPW to do what they should do anyway. It sounds like it, it's it's come to light that there is there's an issue that needs to be addressed, and I I think this meeting and and hearing from the comments of the neighbor has been neighbors have been good, in that regard. I have reservations about putting this on all of the onus uh, for coming up with a plan for DPW to stop doing something they shouldn't be doing in the first place. I, I it's good that it's this conversation is facilitating that. Um, I mean, so I I would say I would at the next meeting. It certainly, to the extent that you know, uh, Danny and and the developer, they're in the uh, ongoing conversation with DPW. They're in a good position right now to address these things, um, and that makes them good doobies and neighbors to do that. Um, and we, I would welcome more information. I think the neighbors would welcome that information. But um, I. I'm hard pressed to see. I, I guess I, I, I could. It could take some form where it, it ends up being a condition. Uh, I, I it, you know, it, it translates into some kind of condition. But right now, um, it's in the interest of, of, of understanding how the site's going to work and and getting more information. Uh, I, I don't think I'd certainly be prepared at this point in time to to tell the to developer that they are you know, should be thinking in terms of a condition or as opposed to being good neighbors and, and making sure that this, this process, you know, works for, for the neighbors and developers. Good. Other items that the planning board feels that need to be addressed that we don't have enough information. I would like, um, I would like to hear a little bit, um, and I wasn't able to go see before tonight, and, and I knew that we were likely going to be continuing this, so I knew I was going to have another opportunity, but um, I am a little concerned about the uh, the parking situation and the, I, and the thought that it, it it's, I mean, it's one thing now if, if neighbors are all getting along and, and people are, are, you know, doing this, I, I mean, I can't visualize it from tonight, and I will go look, um, but I would like some more information to make sure we're not having a, we're not creating an issue down the road with how that works. And, and maybe some thought to whether or not that, you know, parking has to be this way or there isn't another way to avoid that. Um, so I just want to say, you know, you're not meeting at the end of July. The next possible meeting would be August 13th. I know there are a couple of permits that are in line already to are trying to get on the August 13th agenda. So it will be, you know, a full agenda um, because you're only meeting once in August, the meeting after August 13th would be September 10th. So um, those are the 
two dates that you might want to look at depending on you know how much information how, how long it takes for the applicant to address the the stormwater issues and the alignment and the utility conflict issues um, one date might make more sense over another Well, I would, I don't know where the applicant is in terms of their timeline, but I think if we already have a couple of uh, <clears throat> other hearings, other applications scheduled for our next meeting, we would really be uh, pressed to shoehorn uh, the final one of this in there. I, think now, I haven't confirmed which applications will be ready. Um, I know you're going to have at least one and there's another one that the applicant wants to be on the agenda. Um, but it's not clear yet whether they're ready to be on. So I just wanted to put them. <laughs> and it's not certainly mandatory, but it would be great also if between now and then the uh, Conservation Commission was able to meet um, and we had any feedback from them or they came upon a ruling to some kind of decision. I must admit I'm a little bit um, Questionable, I guess, about the idea of mowing those Japanese knotweed on that steep slope and thinking that grass is going to grow there and the uh, homeowner is going to have a contractor who's going to do that on a regular basis on that steep slope. Um, and if that's part of the stormwater management plan, I'm, I, I assume the DPW is looking into that also. Um, but hopefully the Conservation Commission will have some advice or some um, ideas about that. Being an old Japanese knotwood hand, I know that uh, you really have to stay on top of it. But okay, so then we'll, from what I'm hearing, Planning Board, and please speak up. We're we're looking for a motion to continue this until Carolyn. I'm sorry, those two dates were either August 13th or September 10th. I believe. Let's see. Can we hear from Can we hear from uh, uh, the applicant about their their timeline and whether or not one of those would be terrible or awful or better? Um, John, do you, do you think that it's reasonable to resolve the stormwater issues by August thirteenth? Uh, we will have some kind of. It's, it's going to depend on when I can get in to see somebody or get somebody on the phone. I need to speak to someone not just send text back and forth. So it's hard to say. Um, so it's not just getting information to them by the 13th. It would be, you know, revised plans with at least probably two weeks of review time for the DPW. No, we're not um, going to do that by the 13th. By August 13th? Yeah, it's a month from now. Yeah. No, I don't think so. By the time we get to talk to them, that, so that gives us two weeks to get the thing, the plans done. It's going to depend on what their, their one of the comments they made was the uh, the mitigation. Uh, I'm taking mitigation to mean water runoff from the entire site. They're taking mitigation to mean water runoff into the pipe. And one of their comments said is we can't we can't have any more water entering the pipe than what is entering now and right now there's none entering the pipe we have our own pipe so there's a miscommunication that's gone on i think somewhere from the meetings that i had early on versus where we are now so it sounds like you don't think we can make the august 16th, 13th uh, i i don't with, think that's with two weeks. So. I, I, by the time i talk to somebody get plans get a design get it revised yeah. So then I would move that we continue this to uh, September, what is it, the 10th? September 10th. 10th, right. To se September 10th. And you, uh, 7 o'clock, if you, or be, you need to specify a time. It could be 7, 7.30, whatever. Uh, do we want to do 15 minutes of public comment first and say 7.15 or? Sure. Seven o'clock is fine. Either seven or eight. There's no really public comment to be concerned about. We can still post okay. it for seven. Okay, so it's seven o'clock then. That's they, so they've had a late night with us tonight. Let's uh, give them the early slot. 
A motion has been made. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. So discussion. Yeah, sorry. I'm having trouble okay. with my internet. I turned the video off. Okay. All right. So discussion on the motion. I know we have someone from the public who'd like to speak one time, probably for clarification. And I think it's okay to do that at this point. The public hearing is still open. So Claudia. Yes, just a quick question about the utility conflict issue that was mentioned. I know that Carolyn just said that the DPW comments are in the public folder, but is this the place for me to ask about what this utility conflict issue actually is? And if this is not, what would it be? It's in the, D it's all, the DPW has very um, specific comments. So all of those, um, Basically, the board is asking the applicant to address those for the continuation. Yes, but if some of those are called utility conflict issues, I assume the conflicts are with me. And so I would like to understand them clearly. Not necessarily. Do I do that? No. Yeah, I mean, they are, they're, they're varied. So if the pipes are too close to, some lines are too close to other lines. There's not the right depth. So there are a, a various, issues that have been identified. So it's not necessarily particular to your property. There is one, if I may say, there is one issue that might be uh, relative to your property and that's that your sewage line is actually crossing, at least the DT DPW came out and marked it as if it's on uh, 36 Hampton Avenue's property. Okay. So the sewer connectors running through the driveway that we want to dig up um, or near it. So we need to we need to have a discussion with with DPW as to how we can put this on the drawings and satisfy them that it's going to be taken care of. We'll either have to move that line a foot one way or the other, or we will have to. Uh, move the telephone pole or we will have to move the drain. Many of the comments were about all of those things converging in the same place. So the, so we've got to sort out how far do they want them apart. They didn't put that in the comments. Um, so I, I need to ask those questions and then, then we can start laying out if we can push everything toward the building on 36 that exists then we'll do that. If we can't do that, then we've got to move the pole. So there's there's a bunch of things that are kind of up in the air until we have the discussion with the person who did the review. Okay, thank you. They kind of flagged a, 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 some potential problems, but they didn't say, do this, do that, do that. So I, I just need to get to a point of what we need to do. Thank you. All right, and does the applicant feel comfortable with the other information that the planning board has asked for the next hearing? Yeah, I assume the minutes will all be written up and okay. we'll be able all to right. go through it one, one point at a time. Okay, good. All right, any other discussion about the motion made to continue the hearing till uh, September 10th at seven o'clock? So again, just for clarification, all the neighbors and abutters are invited again. On the agenda, you'll have an invitation to a Zoom meeting. You'll be able to look at the records, the public record folder again. You'll be able to submit other letters if you want the public hearing is still open. Okay, so because it's a Zoom meeting, we record all our votes by a voice call. Carolyn, can you do this alphabetically or would you like me to? I don't know if it's going to be alphabetically, but I'll start. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> um, Melissa Fowler. How do you vote? You're, you're muted, Melissa. Sorry. Yes. Okay. David Whitehill. Yeah. Alan Burson. Yes. Marissa Elkins. Yes. Uh, Chris Digger not? Yes. George Kohan? Yes. Did I get everybody? I believe so. Okay. 
Yep. Thank you. That's unanimous. Um, that's unanimous. So thank you folks for attending the meeting tonight. Um, thank you to the applicant for all your information. Um, and we'll see some or most of you on September 10th. You're welcome to stay on to listen to our other boring details on the agenda. Or if not, um, adios. Thank you. Bye. So what's left on our agenda is um, approval, review and approval of the minutes of June 25th. So move to approve. Second. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Marissa. All right. Minutes have been moved and approved. Any discussion? No changes. Oh, oh gosh, here we go again. Um, Carolyn, the voice. Uh, Melissa. Yes. Uh, Davis. Yeah. Marissa. Yes. Alan Verson. Yep. Krista Granat. Yep. Is that it? Okay. And, and George. Yep. And George. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you know. And Carolyn's going to lead us in a discussion on the Hinkley Trace Tree post permit tree removal and replacement. Right. So um, I need to pull up this. I'm sorry. I, I tucked this away here. Um, so um, some of you were on the board when a project for eight units was approved. Um, um, um all, just under two years ago um for um it was a single family home and it's demolition of that home and uh reconstruction or building to, um four duplex units on the site um was that the jonathan wright project Karen? yes it was and i am going to pull up um just so you're familiar i don't think google earth will um show current conditions but um so the issue is that um they as part of the project jonathan wright um did um take some trees down that fell under the tree replacement ordinance requirement so replacement was was completed and they actually paid into the tree fund because they couldn't plant a number of trees on site and you may have remembered um those of you who are on the board um for this may have also remembered that um, uh, I guess it is here, I'm gonna pull this up and screen share, um, that they, Jonathan came back and asked for removal of um, another, um, some other trees that um, would be blocking, uh, if he didn't take them down, they would block solar access and so the board approved that. So I don't know if you can see this, I just pulled up Google Earth, but this is the site here. Nanachuk Street is here. This is Hinkley Street here. Um, so there are um, trees along this edge that were supposed to be protected as part of the plan. And they are now in serious decline. Both, they had um, both the city tree warden has looked at these as well as a private arborist to say that there's some trees in this area that um, need to come down. And um, they are, um, I'm gonna pull up this um, email that shows the plan. Um, <sighs> I don't know if you can see this now. Is the plan with the trees marked out um, shown up on the screen for you guys? Or is it still Google Earth? Google Earth. Okay, so um, uh, what happened was, um, let's go back here. Um, there are trees, so since they're still within the two year window of their site plan approval, they're as homeowners association now liable for the trees that now have to come down that essentially have failed because of the construction. Um, so, um, 
they will, I'm just going to put this up. Um, whoops, let's go here. So now can you see this plan? So there's um, several trees that I think add up to 54 inches that they would have to replace. Um, and so the, the reason why I'm coming to you today is to say that, um, you know, one, that means the site plan is going to change because these trees are coming down um, or need to come down as they've been identified as, as hazard trees um, at this point. Um, and two, the Homeowners Association being brand new doesn't have a big pool of extra resources um, to pay either replace the trees or pay into it, much less they have to get money to have these trees taken down before they fall on these brand new units. Um, oh. They've also had an assessment that indicates that they can't actually uh, plant new trees um, in these locations because the soil is apparently so poor that um, uh, the uh, trees won't take and won't survive. So um, I'm just looking here for the final number. Um, and so I'm bringing it to you as one asking um, uh, sort of this administrative review for you to allow a payment into the tree fund for these trees. Um, and just looking at what the comment was for the soils. Um, I thought you said they didn't have any money, Carolyn. <laughs> well, they're also asking to make incremental payments across oh, I see. You know, okay. several months. <laughs> right, right. So, and they're not asking, I mean, they'd love to get out of the replacement requirements, but I didn't really put that on the table as an option because the zoning really doesn't allow for that. Um, but I think that we can sort of provide an opportunity for them to make uh, payments over time instead of a one, you know, a lump sum payment. Um, so there are six trees that need to come down, but not all of them fall under the tree replacement. So they're not all 20 inches or greater in, um, in size. And so um, this, what I needed to bring to you was A, a change in the site plan because these trees that were originally gonna be protected are coming down. And then B, if you're okay with um, payment into the fund, and over time, as opposed to planting on site. Um, as opposed so to what? Planting new trees on site, oh. which apparently oh. is not um, feasible. Um, so that's, um, that's where we are for that one. It's, um, hard, it's hard to think that the soil won't accommodate mature trees if in fact there were mature trees there already prior right. to the construction. What kind of assessment was done? Um, yeah, so um, I, I think it's so there, the, apparently the arborist has said that the whole site, that area is overrun with weeds, roots and rocks. And so they grew up around the trees. Um, I had the same question for them. Um, and that was the response. Um, well, and maybe it's the existing, you know, now diseased trees, the root systems from those are, you know, is so extensive that it would be. Yeah. We can take the trees down, but we can't, you can't get rid of those extensive root systems. I mean, I mean, with an excavator, yeah. you can always just put soil there that'll take a tree. I don't see yeah. what, I mean, it's just a cost issue. And that may be fact, you know, a factor of that. The, again, sort of the um, um, coming in, you know, they're right up at, in that sort of 15 foot side setback is where those trees are. So it's between new buildings, you have 15 feet of the property line. So in terms of getting equipment in there and <coughs> excavating all that soil and then bringing in no, new soil, it, it makes the situation, you know, that much more complicated. 
Right. Well, and the cost to do that might be far in excess of the, of the paying a replacement cost. Right. Right. I don't understand the reason that it comes within the tree replacement ordinance. I, I, I'm missing something. Um, either, I mean, these are trees that are diseased, not by any action of theirs. They're, the trees need to be taken down because otherwise they're gonna fall on the buildings. Either they should have been identified as uh, trees that were vulnerable at the time of the application, then they wouldn't have had to account for them in the replacement. Or even now, uh, I, they, the tree, nature has killed the trees. I, I don't understand why they owe the city anything. Um, well, uh, because nature hasn't killed the trees. I think the trees, and, uh, so there are two things. One is when an application comes in, the, and in particular, the tree replacement ordinance requires there's a, there is first of all there's a look back period for anyone coming in with a project so if if trees were taken down up to 12 months before someone comes in for a, for a project those trees get tabulated into the tree replacement and then any planted trees have to be um certified or, or warranted i should say for two years after a permit's been issued the site plan that the planning board approved showed tree protection for these trees in particular, that they were gonna save them um, and they were gonna become part of that overall site plan that was approved by the planning board. So they're still within the two year warranty period um, that's but required for trees. trees. They're not no, they're not trees. new trees, but there are trees that were supposed to, so once the site plan's approved, that plan is in place um, and, and is valid forever until someone comes in for an amendment. So even if a tree dies that they planted in five years, they're obligated to replant another tree because the site plan is still valid. It doesn't expire um, with time. So it's just as though um, a tree, you know, they're gonna be, obligated to replace any trees whether they were new or old and it's really just about whether or not they fall within that category of, of trees over 20 dbh that have this other kind of calculus that's made in terms of how many trees get replaced for that so it's, it's our assessment on the staff end that because they're in the two-year warranty period that they still are required to replace the trees in accordance with that formula um, otherwise, in the future, like say in five years, if the trees they showed on the site, the landscape plan, die for some reason, they'd still need to replace those, but not at that caliper per dbh formula. It would just be a new tree to, to put in the place of that tree that died. So if the tree had been identified two years ago as being vulnerable, would the result now be the same? No, if it was it was vulnerable and the arborist submitted paperwork saying this tree is a, is diseased or dying or dead, then they wouldn't be obligated to do replacement for those um, sort of hazard trees or risk trees. But these trees were not identified as hazard trees. They were healthy trees. So and it was There's, the construction that caused damage to the root system? Uh, most likely, yep. Not the bad soil. Who no. knows? Who well, knows? I mean, it sounds like that the, it's the, it's the site plan itself in combination with the existing, which now, as opposed to when those trees, you know, began growing, is now full of those trees roots right so and in addition to rocks and things like that yeah um, i think they ought to go back to jonathan right tell them to plant some trees well that's their own private i mean this is really right. we're saying I planning agree. board and then they could on their own say hey we're obligated to you know make a payment what are you going to do right. for us because you killed our trees <laughs> yeah i agree yeah so 
so again, we're at a place where I think we're trying to help this homeowners association save some money, um, which is a tough call. We would much, I would much rather see trees replanted there and the site, um, but we understand that it's gonna cost them already money that the association doesn't have to take the trees down. Unless they can get it from the developer. I, I agree that that's the peak, not really our, no. right. why? yeah, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, if we don't force them to plant the trees, that means the abutters will be the losers. Right. Hmm. Do, do you know, do you have any idea why they haven't gone back to the developer? Uh, no, I don't, I, it's not really, it's not my oh. space <laughs> to get yeah. involved. Right. I mean, nobody suggested it to them. I mean, hopefully they'll, uh, I mean, we could, I mean, we could, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it seems inappropriate for us to make some kind of accommodation for some private individual's cash flow issues. I mean, shouldn't we just give yeah. them the one or two options that we're okay with and let them decide? Because, yeah, I mean, I think we could approve both. We could, we could be like, you can, you can, we don't care what you do. I mean, I don't think we should state a preference for which they do because that's it's within their right to whoever ends up paying for it it's within their their right right to um no right, I, so. I, I think i thought marissa what we can say is no our priority is that new trees are planted on site not that you give us four thousand and six hundred twenty dollars over 12 months to the tree fund where trees get planted out somewhere else one of our well, but, options yeah. is to say yeah i mean the yes in the in the sense that you approved a plan that showed trees along that border because there were issues with the butters and, and wanting to keep some kind of vegetative screen between the properties you have that option to say well you may not be able to plant all your trees but we need something in that area because it was because that was an issue at the time. And then removing these large mature trees is really going to have be quite a big change for that site. Um, so in that sense, you have the ability to say, no, you really do have to figure out a way to plant trees. It, you know, if it's three or four, maybe not the entire replacement requirement along that. Um, Right. But they certainly have the option, knowing that you can't necessarily fit all the required replantings on one site. There, the zoning does allow the option to to do a hybrid where you're paying some and then you're planting some. So we, I think can ahead. we ask them to come back with um, information about how many could be uh, planted there, and then yeah. Uh, because I mean, I think a hybrid I would be in favor of. Or and can we also does it have to be just about trees or can we also say, you know, and it, if not uh, trees, it ultimately will be, you know, this kind of uh, big chay tree, you know, you know, you, you need to come up with a, another landscaping, so, you know, solution to address the uh, about our concerns. Carolyn, when was this approved? Um. <laughs> I had it up here. I think it's, so what month are we now? We're June. I think uh, it was. Um, COVID July. We're in July. <laughs> July. Um, 20, so in, eight, we're eight, 2020. Eight. It was in 2018, I think the fall of 2018. Um, but I can double check right now. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Marcia, I think, asked a question that I totally interrupted. <laughs> Is that? That's okay. What I, what, what I think, Carolyn, is that we can agree in principle, the planning board, that we want to see a best faith effort to replace the screening of the trees and yep. then leave that up to the staff to negotiate that. I think, Marissa, rather than having them come back again with a plan that we look at, 
right? right. We yeah, have I'm to not, look at a I'm good with that. If there's um, <clears throat> right, yeah, we don't want to be in the middle of it through another meeting or two. The, the reason I was asking about the time frame was, you know, a lot of times when there's a new development or something significant, the neighbors obviously are, are wary of change and there's a, a lot of anxiety about things. And it could be that once the project comes along and people live there and it's their neighbors, you know, there's different feelings. Do we have any sense that the abutters feel differently? Because if there's a if it's a bad place for a tree, I don't think we want to say, oh, we love trees no matter what. So always put a tree right in front of your front door. I mean, just it doesn't seem reasonable to put a tree where a tree doesn't belong. So right. if it's just to appease an abutter who doesn't seem to care anymore, is there any way we can get any sense of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the other approach could be um, that I could relay the information to the homeowners that the board really um, prefers having some landscape element, trees, um, some trees planted in this location. Um, but um, some of the concern is based on what the um, abutters comments were during the public hearing process. And if they can come to, if they can bring their abutter in and have that conversation and show to me that there's been some sort of discussion and understanding of what um, that abutter uh, might be concerned about, then we can address it um, that way. And it may be that I just need to bring them in for if there is a bigger change that I might just have them come in for an amendment to the board. But um, I think I, what I'm hearing is it sounds like the board would like to see something there, if not all the plantings, um, and some effort made to see what, um, you know, push them a little bit further or harder on trying to get something planted in that location, as well as get an understanding of, of what the abutters' concerns might be once those large trees come down. Um, so I can take that back to the homeowners and, um, talk through that piece of them with them and then see what they come up with and then just touch back with you all about that. I think I agree with David. I think he makes a good point. It might be that the, the abutters uh, won't care about it anymore. Maybe they they feel it's not necessary. Uh, if they do, I certainly think we should require original plan be somehow complied with. On, on the other hand, I think as soon as the abutter hears the chainsaws going, he or she is going to want to look at their boundary um, and they're going to be concerned. So I would think the association might want to reach out to the abutter and be proactive and say, hey, in two weeks, we're going to be taking down these large trees. Right, right. Um, yep. Yeah like to talk about this mm -hmm. right. rather than have them be faced with. Right. right. I mean, so our preference is for, you know, to keep some, some or all plantings if possible and, and that, but they, sh you know, we should encourage them to talk to their abutters anyway. Right. So, yeah. so does this mean we table it or, or, or continue it or well, there's no, yeah, I mean, I think I have some good information from you all. Um, so I don't, I think m maybe just to be continued, this isn't officially a public hearing. It's sort of just a discussion. I wanted to bring this up with you to sort of see what the, what you all thought about this modification. So I will go back to them and, um, and see what um, additional work they can do to try to figure out a plan planting plan on that side um, and work with their abutters. Yeah, and also I can't imagine that they haven't already thought about the possible liability of the developer, but maybe you could quietly ask them uh, or tell them. I don't think we can suggest that. <laughs> it's not about no, business. Why not? Yeah, I would say, Carolyn, though, you might encourage them to watch the recording of this meeting or this portion of it and the and to think about some of the questions that we had about how it all got organized and how it all came to be in front of us wow can, can you put all of this into some succinct sentences for the minutes 
I'm just going to say, yeah, that you guys discussed this change in the in the Hinkley Trace planting plan. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Right. Good. Yeah. Okay, doke. All right. So, okay. can we move to adjourn the meeting? Not quite yet. I know it's oh, late. Oh, it's uh, oh, Alan. Alan. <laughs> First oh, thing. Menace. No, we did menace. At seven o'clock, Alan, you brought up this issue about our paperwork and how we're getting plans, right? Uh, there's, so I, there's a statute of limitations on my mentioning that. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're welcome. You're welcome to kind of excuse yourself at any point. But while I have some board members here, I just want to get a little feedback about our, your facility with access in the plans over the past couple of months um, on the, the city shared folder. Um, and if you have any to be quite honest, I'm having a little difficulty kind of viewing them, printing them off. And so part of my question is, do you have any tips and tricks for me? Or do you have any other suggestions for the planning office as far as filing those and disseminating them to the planning board members that we can use in a very practical way? I think it's a really good lesson in the uh, availability of these drawings to the general public. And I don't think any special accommodations should be made to the planning board. This is how the public can view the plans. We should have the same access. And you know, if you wanna send it to get printed, that's fine. But like, why should we make it so much easier for us than for the public? Because the public is not having an easy time. And if we're gonna make it easier for them, we'll do it because we want it easier for us too, you know? Well, I think I misspoke then, David. I, I think, our our uh, uh, our work is for the public, so I think we also want to make it easy as easy for the public as we can to access these. And I know the public; I've spoken to some of them have had difficulty also, um, kind of navigating the system. Yeah, I felt my ability to review the applicant's proposal was definitely limited because I couldn't read the plans. So if we're if we have a function to play as the planning board, I think it's necessary that we be able to read the plans. Right, but I'm what I'm saying if if we have a computer system that's, that we're not able to read the plans, and we're saying, oh, it doesn't really work for us, so we need printed plans. The general public has every right to see these plans too, and they're not able to. So if that's the case, let's fix the computer system or whatever. Well, I, I, don't know. I, I think... haven't had any problem. In this particular case, the plans were very difficult to read because there's a lot of information crammed in at a very, um, you know, a scale that wasn't appropriate for the size uh, and the amount of information. And that was certainly one of the DPW's comments. So we could potentially require scaling to be different um, so that yeah. it's more easily legible on a, you know, in a PDF format electronically. Um, but uh, we've never given paper copies to the public. Um, they can come into the office and look at a paper copy, and they still can once we're open to the public. But um, yeah, just to be clear, I'm not saying we should give paper copies to the public. I'm saying this is a really good check of what the public has to deal with to see these things. And the fact that we have to go through the same thing means we are actually paying attention to it. That's all I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I agree. I don't think it's a question of equity or fairness. We have an obligation, and if we can't read the plans, we can't fulfill our obligation as planning board. So, what was the issue? Well, that I think had? we all agree that you should. We should be able to read the plans. I don't. I, I think. I, I think David's point is that we we need to to fix the mo You know, all the accessible ways that they're made available to the public and, and to us. Um, I, I mean, for my part, I think that um, it's, it, it, as things have gone to be online and, and we're making these things available by PDF, it's, it's, it's time to do technical specifications that say to what scale and to require, you know, certain, um, uh, and to require, I mean, there's certain kinds of things that you can re require in terms of like scale and the, um, that PDFs have to be searchable and I mean there's a number of I'm sure you can find some templates for and well, or making people like if they submit plans and they don't fit the technical specifications and they need to go back and 
redo them. Carolyn, doesn't the planning department have requirements as to the size or readability or scale of plans? We do have a scale requirements. Um, and, uh, but we haven't changed anything since March about, you know, what it has to, in terms of its legibility for digital um, legibility, I guess I would say. Um, so that is definitely something that we can look into um, in terms of, and so yes, we could reject plans because they don't meet our scale. Um, typically it's one to 20, um, or I'm sorry, um, actually for major projects, I think we had um, one for large plan sets, one to 40. Sometimes we allow one to 20, but it really depends on, um, and we've been pretty good about rejecting plans that aren't that smaller scale plans um, or, or sort of smaller scale projects, I should say. Um, sometimes applicants have uh, difficulty complying with that. So we should probably push harder about that. It seemed like the DPW had a, an issue with these plans this time around. Um, so, so David, I, 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 I fully acknowledge that you're in the business, and so is Marissa, of looking at a lot of blueprints. You probably have some tips, tricks of technology that I'm not either aware of or don't have at my fingertips in order to look at these plans and, and in, a, in a much better way than I can. Um, so maybe what I need is some kind of tips and tricks again of how to access them on my computer so that I can blow them up and print them out in some fashion. Um, maybe that's a little bit of my frustration. Yeah, that's kind of what I, I was getting at. I, I, I mean, I think there's like a tool online where you can zoom in and stuff and I find that yeah. basically unusable. So you, if you just download everything and look at them like PDFs on your computer, it's pretty easy to look at things. But it, it, the system doesn't make it super easy to download lots of files. You kind of have to figure it out. So I think that's what I was getting at with the, like the public would appreciate that also. I think like an right. easier way to access the, the drawings. Right. Yeah, George, for whatever difference, I have the same problem. I try. I spent a while trying to read the plans and download them so I could print them. I couldn't do anything with them. Maybe that's just me. Well, I mean, pr printing what are basically scaled down PDFs of, you know, very large, you know, plans, that, that's never going to go very well. I don't think printing's ever going to go very well. Yeah, I think the, right. the trick is, is to, I, I, you know, frankly, I don't know that I've used it sort of within the, the, the browser app. I always, I, I download not to print, but to be able to view it in Adobe Acrobat um, Pro you know, so any sort of PDF viewer that easily allows you to, to scroll up and, you know, zoom in and zoom out is the kind of thing and then move the, 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 the PDF around. Um, I mean, some of it is limited. You to already figure. lost me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose um, uh, it's kind of hard to do. Well, I suppose we could do it in the context of like a screen sharing where uh, those of us who are a little more tech savvy could could do a little tutorial of dealing with PDFs and the you know tips and tricks. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we'd need to spend a lot of time on it, but I mean, I could be happy to do that with you, Alan, um, and anybody else who wants to do a separate Zoom call uh, to look at that. And, um, and it might, but it might. It might be that I have to splurge and buy the Adobe Acrobat Pro instead of no. just trying to do it all on no, Uber. I, no, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I think it's Adobe, all free stuff. Regular it's Adobe would be fine. Yeah. But the trick is, is getting it out of right. You know, not relying on this on this browser app that this that the city has, which I agree is sort of clunky and it's kind of slow and it depends on um, how you know fast your internet is. Like right. especially like moving the image around in the window. Oh. That is spluggy. Well, or good. Carolyn can tell people to submit more readable plans. Has there been any 
guidelines from the state about like open meeting law. Like there's people who only have access through like mobile devices and there's all kinds of things that need to be thought about not, that aren't gonna be solved by like our committee. Yeah, I would look sense? for some, some place that has good good technical specifications for its submissions, for its digital submiss submissions and just rip them off wholesale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really wouldn't put more effort into it than anybody else has put into it. Um, yeah. I would find somebody who put some effort into it and and start there. <laughs> okay. Okay. I can I'll and, I can look into that. Okay. And the only other thing is sometimes the links that Carolyn sends us in different formats, if a link and a Bennett hyperlink is in the, her email or it's in her um, staff notes, it doesn't always bring me to that spot on the laser fish. What's your short term thing for the archive? Web link or laser fish? What do you call yeah. it, Carolyn? Uh, laser fish, yeah. Yeah, laser fish. So often I have to like close out of my browser, refresh, clean out the case that cast, and then I can go and see it again. But so there's something clunky there also. Yeah. Um, George, yeah, are you using a computer from the, the this century or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I had the same problem. I, I was able to click on the link um, Monday and get to everything and the rest of the week I wasn't able to click on it and get to anything where I could find that map parcel ID anywhere. So, but George and Carolyn helped me out this afternoon. And so yep. Anyway, Marissa are, you, Marissa, are you saying we need a computer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know how you've been doing these Zoom things. I don't. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Carolyn, and I'm certainly not pointing any fingers at anybody. I know you're just one of many departments in the city that had to go along with this IT decision about using laser feasts and all. So, I'm sure there's other other folks who are dealing with frustrations. Um, yeah. Uh, um, and perhaps as I keep working with it, we keep working with it, I'll find some of those shortcuts, some tips and tricks. Um, but I know it is it is somewhat frustrating, especially when I go out on a site visit and I can't read the fine print on any of the plans. So I have to get better about printing off just certain pieces of the plans that are yeah. relevant to the site visit. Yeah, because I can't bring a laptop to the to the woods and hope that I get uh, a Wi-Fi signal and I can pull it up there, you know. Well, but you you can you you just have to download it so that you're not you're not downloading out of the woods. <laughs> you I mean you can have the PDFs on your computer to access. That's true. That's true. It's well, you make it sound like Northampton's so rural and there's no <laughs> internet access anywhere. <laughs> well, Carolyn, I, Carolyn, I would I would say for my part is I hate the paper. I fine with the digital. It is. Okay. Awesome when when it's unreadable, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I do. We do I'll, need to I'll, do. I'll know that love and I'll know the freedom that is being paperless. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> well, I definitely I know what I need to work on, um, so I'll I'll try to get uh, get that together for you guys. Um, All right. Thanks for hearing. Thanks for hearing us out. Um, yep. So now, if there's a motion to adjourn. Uh, I move we adjourn. Second. Second by Alan. Okay, all those in favor of adjourning, let's start with Melissa. Yes. Uh, David. Yes. Uh, Marissa. Super yeah. Super yeah. <laughs> and Alan. Yep. And Chris, are you still there on your couch? Oh yeah, I'm here on my couch. I'm listening. All right. Do you want to adjourn? Yeah, I definitely want to adjourn. Okay. And George says yes, it's unanimous. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you all. See you in a month. See ya. Bye. Bye.